So what do you want to talk about? First off, there's a lot of comments on my channel that you're my son. Can you clarify that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, not technically, <laughs> no, definitely not. We could keep the rumor, keep the rumor well, mill going. Why not? I'm sorry to insult you like that. <laughs> I, I used to have a thick head of curly black hair, just like you do. And a red, reddish beard. It was a little bit uh, reddish and black. You could see a little bit of reddish on the oh, that's mustache. Funny. Are we, are we, rec are we recording? We're recording. Yeah. This is all going to okay. be scandalous. I wasn't sure if you. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. I, it feels like I. I know you and I don't know you because I've been watching uh, you for years. Funny. But anyway, I love your episodes, have for years and years. And um, cool. I was just going back today and looking at some of your very first ones because you had said you started with an iPhone 5 with a, tied to a cymbal stand on a rubber band and it would fall off now and yep. then. They yeah, that good. was how I started. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as it could be. I mean, I, I tried to use like the higher quality camera on it. But yeah, I've, I've definitely been watching you for a while too now. And I have noticed one thing that's definitely a good sign is like sometimes I'll make a video about a topic after yeah. you did and then I'll see your video and then I'll, I'll watch your video and we have made several of the same points. Yeah. It some, sometimes happens with Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan too, like independently thinking of the same thing or like pulling up the same study in response to somebody which yeah, i think is like uh, at least a sign that you hopefully you're hopefully that doesn't mean you're you're all just brainwashed to think the same thing but it means that you're uh, actually Living coming to the, the right mobile. conclusion <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's really great when i said i i feel like i know you and i don't know you i don't know that much about your background your education you never really other podcasters or you know video stars say, oh, I'm, you know, uh -huh. I got my master's degree in nutritional science and I was an honor student or whatever. And then they go into uh -huh. the episode. So you know who they are. You just say, hey, it's Mike. Uh -huh. Off you go. Which is why, yeah, I have, a, it's sort of a mix for me in the sense that it's like, I talked about how I've had a sustainability, a bachelor's of science and sustainability. So my background is sustainability. It's not, it's not nutrition or health science, but I'm one semester away from finishing my master's in public health. Hmm. which I probably, sh I mentioned sometimes, but I probably don't mention enough. And so I don't feel like I am leaning on credentials. And so that's why it's sort of the mantra of my channel. And it will always be, even if I had a PhD in nutrition, it would be um, every claim that I make is going to have a link, at least significant claim that I make. I'm not going to back up the fact that my name is Mike in the description below. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people still think it's Mick, so maybe I should. Um, <laughs> but the idea is every major claim is going to be backed up by science and that's the idea is that you're not relying because it's dangerous to rely on the person's credentials and not care about what they're citing and so i want to be relying on the peer reviewed research and i'm i i look at myself really as just like a, a health science writer basically mm -hmm. is what i am mm -hmm. and so yeah it's good that i've i've already pretty much done all of the classes in my mass in public health i've done this the statistics class so the epidemiology classes and all of that mm -hmm. So I now, and, and I, that wasn't the case always when I was doing my channel. I have been doing my master in public health really slowly, though, because I've been like paying for it as I go because mm -hmm. I didn't want to get into student debt, although it might have been forgiven now. For me, it's not the person who I am. It's the links in the description below and what are how qual high quality are they and just being the goal is to be a level above in terms of how much you're proving what you're saying compared to the the even if it's a doctor that is, uh, you know, pushing like a low carb meat based mm -hmm. diet or something like that. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it's information over person, I guess is what I, my goal is. Yeah. Well, you are that. I, it, I'm always surprised because it's like, hmm, I don't know his background too well, something, something about environmental science. And then I watch your episodes and I think, dude, I mean, he really backed it up with, how do you do all that research? One episode that really got me was the one on why the Great Salt Lake is drying up. Oh, and yeah. I thought, oh, so I know something about this. I'm an earth scientist. Oh, yeah, cool. Because that's an episode I was thinking, hmm, maybe I'll do that. I've been obsessed with the <laughs> water shortage in the southwestern states, the 17 yeah. states. I have another video coming up on it. Oh, but you good. Can keep going. Have anyway. you seen the Vox little six-minute episode on that? I haven't, actually. Oh, I'm going to send you that link. It's, it's so good. It's a masterwork. This represents all the water used in one year in the Western United States. That really affected me how 
much impact they could have in six minutes with that video. Oh yeah. They have these visual aids. It wasn't a persona on the camera. But this is all the residential water use for 115 million people across 17 Western states. All the lawn watering and toothbrushing and pools and showers use only 6% of all water consumption. Then they pour off some commercial water and that's 8%. And that includes commercial buildings and hotels with their fountains out in the front. And probably even golf courses, as much as I hate the idea of just uh, watering all of these golf courses for a few people. 86% is what's left, and that's for uh -huh. irrigated crops. And as you can imagine, 32% of the total water footprint is just for crops to feed cows. Cows are the elephant in the room in so many things. Deforestation of the Amazon, the drought. Anyway, so I was watching this this episode you did on the drying up of the Salt Lake, and I thought, dude, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's done his research. Well, thank you. He's got however many thumbs up I can give it. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought it was a great episode. Yeah, no, yeah, that one was really interesting to me. Um, and I was just shocked unto myself looking at it because people hadn't connected it to animal agriculture. They were blaming, again, blaming residential, as you say. And then you funnel it down. And I, wish, I wish I did have more time and a whole team so I could do all these just like crazy visuals of of uh, how much, you know, water fits in a, in a container or something so people can really understand and, you know, maybe get a hose out and fill stuff up and, oh, and yeah. things like that. And the next video I am going to do, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to frame it, but just the, the whole um, Colorado River not making it to the ocean thing, which has been happening for a while and everybody's been, been saying, oh, you know, it's because these cities are taking up all the water. And yeah, the population growth obviously does play a role because increased population means you're going to have more people farming and then developing land for farming as well. And so people just, they don't think animal agriculture when they're thinking Colorado River, which there is obviously a role there. I'm going to explore exactly how much it is. Is it as much as the Utah situation? I don't know, but I'm glad I didn't get anything wrong with the earth scientist thing. And for those that didn't watch it, the, the danger is that since they've exposed 70% of the bed of the Great Salt Lake, and that has toxic arsenic that naturally occurs because it's a terminal lake that then turns into dust and, of course, can, through dust storms, be exposing people to a lot of carcinogens over the next few decades, millions of people. So that's that's the uh, <laughs> the elevator pitch for for why we don't want to do it, of course, because it, it, was, it was a range, but I think it was about 80%, roughly 80% can be pointed to animal agriculture for water usage there. Interesting. I did my undergraduate in geophysics at the University of Utah. So I was very familiar with the Great Salt Lake Basin and how it, you know, comes and goes and so on. But basically, it's draining streams from the mountains, which are rich in minerals, okay. granite and everything else. Those streams are, you know, are constantly eroding those mountains. And okay. so it distills out this great number of minerals. And then when the wind comes, those minerals blow into the city and you breathe it. Especially if the crust is disturbed. They did a bunch of sort of full, full scan sort of, or well, they did take the little dust vacuum machine and they put it down and, and measured where the crust was good and where it wasn't. And I just saw a video, gosh, it made me cringe so hard. It was a TikTok of just these guys going out on the Great Salt Lake with their uh, their like four by four dune buggy things and just ripping up, just destroying the crust. And just, oh, that needs to be made illegal immediately because that that is like, gonna, that's, they're like, it's, you can just like count the amount of people they're murdering probably <laughs> in, over the next decades. I'll send you my slides from a TEDx talk that I just gave uh, last week in Boston. It was on planetary stewardship. It was a great, it was the best TEDx I've ever seen at MIT's Media Lab. And my talk was one simple change to save our forests. And I had to back it up with a lot of data. And fortunately, there is great data coming out of Oxford and our world in data that shows what an impact cows have. So one of the charts uh, shows that, you know, we use something like 5 billion hectares now for agriculture globally. If you took cows out of the picture, except for dairy, just for beef, that number would be cut in half. It's shocking. Uh, and then if you cut dairy out, which removes the rest of the cows, it cuts it in half again. It's shocking. And so I think people think a planet-friendly diet would be lacto-vegetarian uh, because it doesn't include fish, pork, and chicken. But those charts don't show that. It's far from that. Anything that involves a cow, that's why, you know, 80% of the deforestation in the Amazon is driven by cows. Yeah, exactly. And I would add, yes, yeah, send them my way. And I would also add that it's getting more interesting when we're now feeding these massive, basically confined animal feeding operations of things like salmon 
off the oh. coast were just dropping soy pellets and stuff into like these tilapia and salmon farms and stuff. So that's now, now, now these animals that are fish are having a land imprint that is huge is where their footprints going to yeah. be growing and growing as we decided to do that. So yeah, maybe moving in the wrong direction on that one, but uh, hopefully uh, we can get some more people to eat plants and, and uh, slow that down. <laughs> well, that brings up a good question. Um, if you're a vegan, uh, like you and I both are, what, what about this issue with a little bit of salmon once or twice a week? Um, because mm. the Seventh-day Adventist study led by Gary Fraser, he said, boy, vegans are superior in every way in terms of lower incidence of diabetes, BMI, you know, blood pressure, everything except longevity. And the pesco vegetarians live a little bit longer than the vegans do. But he didn't explain why. And I know you and I have both gone through this question of our Microalgae you, tablets healthy, you know, mm -hmm. or do they cause prostate cancer? Is, where, where have you landed on mm -hmm. all that? I've heard there's a few answers on this, and I don't know the real answer. The Dr. Gregor answer on that one was, hey, the pes the pescatarians were actually eating more whole plant foods than, I don't know where he got that data, more whole plant foods than the vegan group, which is kind of funny to say, like, they were the pescatarians were more vegan than the not. But uh, it could also represent um, vegans still polishing up those corners of, like, that little bit of fish could have literally been a B12 supplement for mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. And now we're taking B12 supplements. All the new studies are showing how the vegans have the same levels of B12, uh, not statistically significantly different in terms of deficiency rates, study after study. And so that is knocked out. But of course, we don't have new data for that. It's also, you know, there's, you know, how statistically significant was that? I'd have to check again. I believe that the there wasn't statistically significantly different between those groups, so no real claim could be made, but they it were was very different. similar, yeah. Something like yeah, so it's it's all uh, you know, statistically a little bit cloudy there of like what would happen if we have more people like I'd love to have a hundred thousand vegans and their mortality and longevity data and all that stuff. Well that was what you're talking about specifically is uh the all cause mortality rate. Right? Yeah. Or are you talking about? Yeah. Yeah. All cause we don't have telling. longevity numbers. Yeah. Which I'd love more studies. It's interesting that even Walter Longo suggests eating fish once or twice a week. My, the, I have six reasons for being vegan. So I, for me, it's ethical of like fish feel pain. I just do not, like, even if it was uh, like two or 3% lower or something of uh, mortality for pescatarians, I would still be like, man, not worth it. I, <laughs> I'll uh, still be vegan. Um, but, uh, you know, where does the line cross? I, the, the idea is there's not, there's no case that like vegans are going to be dying at a rate that would be compelling to me to not, to, to be eating fish, even if there was a difference, but the difference, and, and there are other things like pescatarians that do, do worse than some of the things the study is like BMI. And so it is possible that, you know, numbers could change. Although it is, you know, there is a case where people who are too low BMI also have their own risk, you know, if they fall, you know, they don't have that, that reserve if they're older. So it is good to have a normal BMI and be good. So I'm, I mean, I've, I'm like a hundred and almost 180 pounds, six one. So like, I'm not, thankfully people haven't said I'm too skinny in a while, <laughs> but oh. even like, as even when I was skinnier, I was still middle normal BMI, uh, still was like completely normal. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's interesting. Cause when I first went vegan, I was like, I'll oh, just keep it. Or when I first was starting to go plant-based. I was like, I'll keep it less than 5% animal protein because that was like the cutoff mm -hmm. for the effect in the mm -hmm. China study. And yeah. so I was like, that'll just be the best of both worlds. And then over time, there were just too many things. I just didn't want to be involved in, uh, you know, things like the fishing industry as well. Yeah. You know, like Sea Spiracy is a great thing to watch for that. And I just don't, I just don't want to contribute to that. And there's also this phenomenon that happens. Maybe you also have, maybe you have the ability to just to just eat something and then not eat something for a very long time. By something, I mean someone, an animal, <laughs> as we say. <laughs> um, but uh, a lot of times, if you just open the floodgates of a food group, um, that's it. I know people who've said that they're vegan plus fish and they eat fish every single time they go out. Mm. And so there's just this this weird mix. Or, or like the joke with my mom was like, yeah, we're 97% vegan. 97% yeah. of our meals are vegan, I've heard my dad. And then, which is good, the intent is there. But then we're like, just as a joke, me and my partner, Lindy, we're like, let's just look at what percent of the meals are. And it was 97% were not vegan because they'd always be like throwing oh. some Parmesan or something, even mm -hmm. if it was a vegan meal. So it's just like how your personal view is of, of what you're eating and how you're including food groups versus not. And I also say that's the same. That's my same view with oil, which I, 
I will say I've loosened up, obviously, on my view of oil after. Yeah, I made a ton of follow-up videos talking about it. Everyone just sees the oil living killer and is like, he's so hardline, but I've elaborated. <laughs> yeah, I've elaborated. I do. I still believe that vegans who die of heart disease are probably, that is mainly driven, especially if they're long-term vegans, would be driven by the consumption of, co- like, especially palm oil, palm-related mm-hmm. oils like coconut oil. Uh, tropical oils with the high saturated fat Mm -hmm. um, that raises LDL because otherwise what else is going to do it? You have to be like slamming peanut butter to get enough saturated fat to really be Mm -hmm. pushing it. And of course people die. Heart diseases can be caused by oxidation of sugar and, you know, being sedentary and stuff like that as well. But just the idea is still, I still think it's valid. I don't think something like extra virgin olive oil is killing people. I do think that, and this is sort of the nuance I didn't make in the video, that it could maybe prevent somebody with extreme heart disease from having as good results. But we don't know. It just seems like, you know, there's there's studies both ways of like, yeah, it helps with endothelial function. No, it hurts endothelial function. Um, So that's that's my view on on oil, I guess, (laughs) which you didn't ask about, but I told you. Well, I was going to. It's in my notes. (laughs) I was going to. Uh, You know, I was quite strict with oil for a long time too, and. um, And I've been noticing Gil Carvalho and Simon and so on, and the, and the Harvard studies have been saying, ah, you know, it's not, it's not like sugar, um, and it maybe even the polyunsaturates lower LDL a little bit. So I'm not so fussy about oil-free hummus now. You know, I'll buy hummus yeah. with canola oil in it or something like that and enjoy okay. it. Um, so and I've there relaxed. are vegans that would probably benefit. Sorry to cut you off. There are vegans that would probably benefit from taking from canola oil because they're eating like just either processed foods or they're just not looking at their diet as a whole and not getting enough omega-3s. And, you know, there's, we need a ton of studies. I'd love to see studies on people getting enough omega-3s uh, from ALA, which is of course the short chain, and mm-hmm. just see how they can do with the DHA. Like how much ALA does the average person really need to get DHA to where they would want it? And then there's also the argument is where do you really want DHA? And, you know, is people, are people who eat fish having just extra DHA that makes their levels look higher? And then we think, oh, that's what you really need. Mm -hmm. But then that could sort of be the cop out of like, no, vegans aren't high enough and you're just using it as an excuse. So I'd love to see data on just like multiple feeding trials at different rates of omegas from different sources and see, you know, because it is possible that there are people who was like, life could be saved by eating canola oil in the sense that it, could like I'll maybe get help them convert DHA and, and maybe lower some platelet aggregation. Who knows if it would do that though? It depends on how much. Speaking of the Seventh Day Adventist studies, Adventist, I think it's pronounced. Whenever I've mentioned them in my episode, some people will comment in the comments section. Oh well, I am Seventh Day Adventist and I've been vegan for thirty-eight years, and uh, and I say, oh, can I call you? <laughs> so I've yeah. called a number <laughs> of them. I've called oh, a number that's of cool. them to just find out what, what is your life like and everything, what are you really eating? <laughs> um, and um, the ones I've spoken to, it's like N equals four, have <laughs> all eaten a fair amount of the, the substitute meats that yeah. Adventist companies make, you know, taco filling, soy-based. I bought some of those off of Amazon to see what's in them and, and so on. And, and I could see, you know, <laughs> the some of the Seventh-day Adventist nutrition professors say, yeah, that's a problem we have with Adventists is they eat a lot of phony <laughs> baloney. They call it phony yeah. baloney. I've heard and that. I did talk to one Adventist and he did say TV. He said like TVP has been a thing for a while. Yeah, like yeah. It was a thing there before, but I don't think that the negative effects of TVP would be as much as like a high coconut oil, high saturated fat right. mock meat. Yeah. But yeah. do you know if they're eating those now? Because they probably are. Probably are. I didn't ask, but I should yeah. have. Yeah. Um, yeah, coconut oil. It, uh, so I have a little bit of post-traumatic stress with coconut oil. I just can't bring myself to eat anything. Oh yeah, and and the reason oh, is, what? well, I studied. I did all. I depended for a while on all the animal studies to promote atherosclerosis in Reese's monkeys <laughs> and pigs and so on to study atherosclerosis for heart disease. I have a book on my shelf. Uh, it's a textbook that's all about that. That displays that lists how those studies are done. And the number one atherogenic agent for all of them is coconut oil, either that or egg yolks. Hmm. They, they would alternate back and forth. You can give a, a dog, a pig, a, a, any any primate, any omnivorous animal, you just give them some coconut oil, give them enough, 20% of their calories with coconut mm-hmm. oil, 
and they get severe atherosclerosis. And one study in particular that I really liked, um, I found it by attending a seminar at Stanford, which is close to me. On the top are coronary arteries from monkeys that were fed a high fat, high cholesterol diet for a year and a half. A group of monkeys that got that same diet were then fed a low cholesterol, low fat diet without a lot of sugar for three and a half years. And their coronary arteries, examples of their coronary arteries are shown in the bottom two panels, much less atherosclerosis. And, but they could get 90% blockage after 18 months. And then they remove the agent and the arteries open back up. See, that's interesting. Yeah, so that's interesting because oh, every time I mention the heart disease reversal thing at all, now it's just like people just like, poo-poo, you suck, you're saying stuff that is not fully proven by science. And of course, the definition, there was a large argument about the definition of what reversal really is. And uh, they're saying, you know, one of the main arguments is really that it's just biochemical, like against the, the, the claim that a vegan or plant-based diet could reverse it, is that it's biochemically impossible to actually remove plaques for your body to a meaningful degree. And uh, when we have something that dramatic, of course, I'd have to look through the studies and, and they say, is it an angiogram? Is it actually dilation? Is it actually being removed? If you're, you know, if we have studies where we have animals with extreme, especially primates who are closely related to us with extreme atherosclerosis, then being reversed through a change in diet. We absolutely have those. We have decades of those. Yeah, which is, uh, but but the, I don't know. I It's such a, that whole argument is such a quagmire and there's so many like nuances and, and stuff like that. But so, you're talking about, elk. of course, coconut LDL can clog, but you're saying, you're not saying that if it goes right up against butter, it's clogging worse, because from what I've seen the human studies is that the butter is, is, raises LDL at least to a higher degree than uh, coconut oil. I haven't oil, seen the comparatives grant. between butter and coconut okay. oil. Okay, okay. But I thought coconut, this oil is, coconut oil is just really cheap to give an animal. It can and get they, the job done, yeah. It can, and it gets the job done. <laughs> That's all they really care about. The book I have, the textbook on the shelf over there, is called Hypolipidemic Agents. And um, uh -huh. a whole chapter on on doing this, and it's it's done still today. You can go get, you know, pigs are very close to us. We use pig parts in our hearts. Um, my 93 year old uh -huh. father in law had a bicuspid valve in his heart, so he got a pig valve replacement. I don't know, almost 20 years ago. Yep. Um, I know someone and, with one of those. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're anatomically they're quite similar to us, and their cholesterols, their LDLs, and so on follow the same pattern as ours do and get raised by the same things. And they get heart disease just like we do and give too much coconut oil to your pig and they get a heart attack. Yeah, that is really interesting. I was going to add, though, the reason, it's my understanding, the reason that butter is worse than, than coconut oil is the actual breakdown of the different types of saturated fat. Um, and I believe it's ironically, it's like palmitate is the one that's higher in butter that's worse. I'd have to, I, I don't like making claims without the information right in front of me. Right. But it was the, the ratios of those, mm -hmm. um, those saturated fats that does it. For some reason, one is more clocky than the other. Yeah, I think that's true. Well. Like stearic acid and dark chocolate, thank heavens, uh, doesn't uh, seem to raise LDL, <laughs> which is good for yeah. me. Because <laughs> I have a, <laughs> oh, I have yeah, a thing for 100% dark chocolate. And uh, Oh yeah, well, it's good. It's I'm, not going to nip you in the artery. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so I have an interesting story um, because I got the bonus pack of of uh, heart disease risk factors. Um, oh, I yeah. Had, I had rheumatic fever as a child, which scarred a lot of my heart and killed a lot oh, of my dang. left ventricle. Dang, yeah. And um, I have genetically high cholesterol, which uh, took the lives of my sister and my dad in heart attacks. Um, and uh, I have a congenital defect, which is a hole in my heart, which allows communication between the two chambers of the heart, which shouldn't be there, uh -huh. uh, which uh -huh. predisposes you to strokes. Um, and wow. um, Triple threat. Yeah, and I was just told last month by my cardiologist I have a quadruple threat, which is my heart rate is so low from all the extreme sport I've done, bicycling and Ironman triathlons and all that, ultra runs, that it predisposes you in older age to atrial fibrillation. So they're going to implant uh -huh. a little thing in my chest to Whoa. monitor for atrial fibrillation. Not that they've ever de detected any. Oh, just any. to monitor. Yeah, I've Did worn a Holter counter several times before, and they haven't detected any. But he looks at my heart rate and says, y you know, you're in the 30s heart rate, and overnight you're 28. Yeah. I mean, that's low. Um, that's exact, the exact same thing is happening to uh, my partner's 
uh, I'll just say uh, somebody my partner knows. I don't want to like give anybody away too much. Um, but yeah, he was a uh, he would bike ride like eighty miles a day. Yeah, and now that he's getting like in his sixties, the doctor was really worried, and they put a you know he they they hook him up, and his heart rate's like thirty, and they they're like, oh my god, we got to put you on all this stuff right now, and yeah, the EKG and all that stuff. And then he's just there. He has to convince them. He's like, I'm, I'm just an athlete. <laughs> and uh, yeah. but still, they're they're saying there is a risk too. And then you know, I don't know. Sometimes can be connected to bradycardia or whatever. Um, all those different things that I'm not a master in and haven't studied deeply, obviously. Uh, but uh, it's interesting how and something that gave you an advantage, um, would actually now be a potential threat. It reshapes of the having heart. a stronger heart. It reshapes the heart. Yeah. So there's one study that gives me courage, which is. Tour de France competitors who've died, we have a big database of them. They live on mm-hmm. average eight years longer than the rest of the population in their countries. Yeah. Um, so bonus, think of it as a bonus. Yeah, bonus. But the incidence of atrial fibrillation, fibrillation is higher among them than it is. And um, so I got hit by a car on my bike training just three weeks out from an Ironman when I was peaking uh-huh. and it uh, fractured my skull and I had to be... Oh my gosh, you've been through it. Yeah, I had to be lifelined by helicopter to Stanford. When I got into the emergency room and they saw my heart rate was 32, my What's heart that? rate was 28 Whoa. as I was sleeping. And they came in and lectured me in the morning yeah. and said, that's too low. Yep predisposes you to risk and you're mm. doing it from extreme bicycling. What are you supposed to Stop do? That. Now you have to be sedentary. Uh, no, stop extreme just, bicycling. Okay, yeah. yeah. Stop extreme <laughs> bicycling. <laughs> and uh, so they have convinced. Yeah. I, I'll go out on an hour run or a two-hour bike or something like that. And they say that's fine. Uh, just don't do what you were doing before. Mm-hmm. Never do that again. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a risk of the other side as well. Yeah. I feel like I have a healthy balance right now of um, I'll play like floor hockey and rock climb every week and uh, stuff like pick up softball where you're kind of sprinting around and stuff little bit of high intensity interval stuff and that's definitely not that's great <laughs> gonna make my heart rate go too low but i yeah. should i don't know because i do have a history of like running track and stuff and it would be nice to get back out and running and it'd be it'd be fun to try to do stuff like that but now i'm thinking like maybe i should this is using this as an excuse to not exercise hard. It's, it's extreme <laughs> it's just extreme level no i'm not a- gonna get there I was doing Iron Man and everything. I noticed on your Instagram, you got a, a really great Instagram feed, and I noticed you were flexing. Well, thanks, once. but I don't post nearly enough. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't either. But I noticed you were flexing, and you got some muscle mass in your shoulders. So. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, that's when I mean I was working out uh, very relatively consistently, and by consistently, I mean like twice a week um, yeah. well, that's, <laughs> through that's last winter. Good. And that was it. That's where I got up to like 180 pounds, which wasn't all muscle. Like I'm gonna be honest, um, <laughs> but it, it was good. And then, but for me, the real thing that did it was rock climbing. Mm. Um, uh, not even muscle wise, but just in terms of feeling good in my body. Because I did, I gained weight, and I just felt like I didn't have control over you know my limbs as much. Of, of like, because I've always been a thin, thin guy. Like when I went first went vegan, I was like 145 pounds. Ooh. And so yeah. It's a vegan, vegan weight gain uh, <laughs> horror story. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Somebody's going to make that video. Vegan deterioration is going to make Mike the vegan's vegan weight gain horror oh, story. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. joking. Um, uh, but basically, so I was uh, I was always like a lighter guy. And then I, so I always felt like I really had control over my limbs and could like lift myself if I needed to do some pull-ups pretty easily. And then I hopped on the rock wall after like working out and trying to eat a lot to like put muscle on. Uh, through winter and then I was like I can't even hold myself on the wall so I started going really consistently Consistently, and now I can do routes that I never thought I'd be able to do mm. so I, I would suggest rock climbing because it's really satisfying yeah. if you like it and like grip strength for jars and yeah. stuff love it yeah, I can relate and respect the guys who want to bulk up and get strong because I, at one time I wanted to do that too and uh, so I used to go to the gym a lot and you know, do more upper body. And I got up to 228 pounds at 6'4". And, oh, well, uh, yeah. And not too much body fat. I thought I was, I looked okay. And, um, mm-hmm. but I just didn't like it because I, I don't, I like to be mobile. I like to play soccer. I like to run. You know, we had kids and everything else and I want to run with them and play soccer. That's what they were interested in. And uh, so I decided to lose it and I went down to 185 at 6'4". And I just felt mm-hmm. so much better. And, yeah, I mean, I didn't look so impressive, but I felt better, and I could move a lot. Yeah, better. it's it's also good a good lesson of like 
you accomplished the goal and realized it wasn't what you wanted, probably wasn't worth, I don't know if you had to, but just trying to eat so much all the time and being so worried about that. And like, I have, uh, I know a professional bodybuilder and they're not even vegan or anything. And I don't know them well, but it's like, if they even get like a cold, they lose like 40 pounds because <laughs> yeah. they get out of the gym for like a week and like they're not able to eat as much. And it's like, I just don't want to be that stressed out about how I look. And uh, I don't, it, it just doesn't matter to me that much. For me, functionality, which is why I feel like getting into calisthenics would be cool. And, you know, there's almost a, there's a calisthenic aspect of rock climbing as well, which is why I'm, I love it. And I'm going to keep doing it, even though I live in Iowa where there's, there's no actual rocks. We don't have rocks yeah. here pretty much. We have limestone, which is like basically crumbles in your hand mm -hmm. um, where I am at least. So, uh, yeah, I'm just on the rock wall the gym yeah fascinating um by the way christopher gardner the stanford professor of nutrition who i regard very highly he just came out with a new paper a week ago i don't know if you saw it on um, substituting meat uh, three different diets for recreational athletes uh, they compared for recreational athletes which are runners and lifters and so on um uh, but not elite athletes they compared a meat diet versus a vegan diet versus somewhere in between no difference in muscle strength or mass mm -hmm. or anything like that. It is That's insane. great to know. I'll have to do a video on that. I sometimes I is it the swap meat one? Yeah, swap meat. Or is that different? Okay, yes. He's a good guy. Yeah, I think they might have done. Interesting. I've started looking at oh, it's yeah, there's only twelve people yeah. in each group. Yeah. Which is I would love to see that with hundred and twenty people in yeah, each yeah. group. And then because that way people will be compelled. It's just like the other one, which I had to do a video on it anyway, because it was so funny, this, the sperm quality one. I just like, because people are, just people who eat meat are just so caught up in like the manliness, masculinity yeah, thing. Yeah. And then it's like the vegans are, have like more sperm and it's more modal and it's just better. And uh, that's just, just to like, trigger some, it's just funny to, to try and yeah. trigger some people on that, even though it was only like 20 people in the study. Uh, you know, an, an, another interesting study for you to do a video on is uh, Iris Shai's study. She's at Ben-Gurion University. Uh, I don't know if you know about her. She's been studying the green Mediterranean diet. Um, so it's taking mm. the Mediterranean diet and reducing the amount of meat content um, and increasing high polyphenol foods. So uh, she adds duckweed um, into your green smoothies and... Ah and has you eat a lot of, uh, uh, drink three cups of green tea a day and so on. And what's fascinating is it's an isocaloric comparison. It's 300 participants, so it, you know, it's a bigger study. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm looking at it right now. And they were able to control it really well. Um, and uh, what's fascinating is isocalorically, when they added more polyphenols, there was a greater loss in liver fat with the additional See. polyphenols. Um, That's good enough. So she's quite fascinating, and she's an associate or a junk professor at Harvard, whatever that means. Uh, she's very highly regarded, and there's a large team that did the studies and everything. And I just thought it was very fascinating because it's this spectrum, like Dean Ornish talks about, the more and more you get to plant-based, the better. But also, I've always been wondering about, like Dr. Furman, it's all about the nutrient density of the foods and all that. Mm -hmm. um, the nutritarian, right? Nutritarian. Uh, does it really matter that much? Did the, it, is there it's a limit to how much broccoli and everything you could eat? But here in the green I've Mediterranean diet, I've been thinking about diet, that too. The, po the polyphenol uh -huh. richness of it did, uh -huh. they, it was a well done study. They had brain scans, they had liver scans uh, uh -huh. you know, with MRI, the whole thing. And, you know, I always thought, okay, saturated fat creates a lot of liver fat. We know that. And so does fructose. Uh -huh. We know that. Uh -huh. But I never was thinking about polyphenols for liver fat. And she seems to have demonstrably showed they're That's a, really interesting. They play a role. Yeah. Um, I, I do, I did actually sweep over this study, but basically I do my, my like vegan study catch up every once in a while. Mm -hmm. And I try to not like cast the net too large. I remember being like, Oh, there's, you know, it's not vegan or like fully plant based. Yeah. So I won't talk about it, but I could do a video on it anyway. Cause I, I didn't even look into it deeply because of that. even though I should have, which is interesting, but I have thought, I've been thinking about the nutritarian diet. And I've been also thinking about like what a whole food plant-based diet or vegan diet really is. Cause I always say whole food vegan. And like, if I had to design a new diet, that was sort of like the, um, the next stage of this. And it definitely would focus on, you know, nutrients to a degree, but it would be about antioxidant timing i think would be the aspect speaking of snacks having like the antioxidant snacks and it's sort of it comes from two angles 
One, of course, the idea that antioxidants are really good for you, obviously, and that they're going to be, you know, reducing oxidative stress, aging, and uh, potentially cancer risk. And the idea that we eat and we get these kind of spikes, you know, we can get our antioxidants up. And of course, different antioxidants go different places and help different things. Some go to your eyeballs, some don't. And who knows how long each of those are are uh, lasting in your system, in your bloodstream, where being where they need to be. So I would, A, love to see a ton of more studies on different antioxidants, how they affect the blood over time. And then I would probably design a diet that just makes sure that you have a good antioxidant status constantly because you can eat the the healthiest meal in the world at uh 9 p.m or, or 8 p.m or something and get a nice spike of blood of blood antioxidants for the couple hours before you go to bed but if you're not eating a lot of antioxidants during the day i mean you're talking about probably i don't know between the 18 and 20 hours of the of your waking cycle not actually having great antioxidant status so you could even have some some people who aren't vegan who are more regularly eating antioxidants and then some vegans that are, of course, eating less antioxidants. Of course, there's any diet that's eating less antioxidants is going to have less antioxidants, whether it's vegan or not. But my idea is just like soak soak the body with antioxidants, similar to the the Esselstyn idea of those nitrates, the five five nitrate heavy steamed leafy Greens green vegetables a day. With vinegar. Exactly, and he does mention antioxidants in that context as well. But thinking about that's for dilating your arteries, keeping your arteries flowing 24 hours a day or whatever, or however long you're awake. But it's like, if you were to even get crazy, I'd love to see a study. Because we used to not sleep the way we sleep right now. Allegedly, we would have that. I can't remember if it's called diurnal or whatever, where you kind of wake up late at night. I'd love to see a study of like, you know, two people on a vegan diet, high antioxidant diet. One is eating their normal three meals and a snack with really high antioxidants. But then keep in mind, they've got this whole section where they're sleeping where they might have by the end especially low antioxidant status what if somebody woke up in the middle of the night on a diurnal sleep cycle had some more antioxidants and then of course your met- metabolism isn't going to be ripping through you know ripping a bunch of oxidative stress through your body when you're sleeping anyway but it, of course it can happen it does happen because you're still alive and you're still burning calories but i'd love to just see is there a way to strategize so that you have and that's maybe getting a little too ocd about it well I, I have something to say about this that I think is pretty fascinating and it's really relevant to me right now. I'm doing an, uh, an episode on Lisa Mosconi, who is a neurologist, gave a, an amazing TED Talk with two million views and everything. She runs the Alzheimer's Prevention Center at Cornell. And so they have PET scans and brain scans, and she also has degrees in nutrition. So her original PhD had a lot of genetics, and she thought genetics would play a bigger role in Alzheimer's than it did. And then she had this career crisis when she found out that genetics is a small part of Alzheimer's and diet is a huge part. What is she going to do? So she had to switch over to diet as the number one factor in Alzheimer's prevention. So she went and got her degrees in nutrition. She started promoting the Mediterranean diet. um, And then she's gone more and more. Now she's totally plant-based for herself because she's, she's finding out that, you know, that's the thing. But one of the things that she said that I thought was fascinating is the brain's nutritional requirements are different than the rest of the body because it's bathed in water. And all of its fat is structural fat. It can't combust any of that fat. Um, It's just there for structural reasons. And there's this blood-brain barrier that only permits some nutrients to cross and not others that the body needs, but not the brain. And she said, so be careful about what you drink. You have to be hydrated enough and... Hard water is better than soft water, and really you should be drinking herbal teas and green teas and things like that. And then she talked about some of the nutrients that the brain needs, and one of those was a controversial one, choline, and she was torn about whether to recommend a couple of eggs a week. You had a great episode on choline. I I loved it. Oh, thank uh, you. So I decided, hmm, maybe I should do a complete mineral panel. Um, so I ordered up this mineral panel. and they Oh, interesting. I've never done that. that yeah, I never have either. What were the results? Tell me right now. Well, have I you done a video I haven't seen them yet, um, but oh, I'm, well, okay. I'm oh, doing yeah, it for this video. I'll watch the video. Yeah, so yeah. They, they took six vials of blood because they had to do zinc, copper. I'm worried about copper because we have copper pipes in our home and oh, most of what we drink. So I make this, or my wife makes this big um, pot of green tea, and we just drink that during the day. 
And um, mm-hmm. but it comes out of tap water from copper, a, a home with copper pipes. Our home is thirty years old. Mm-hmm. So um, what does that mean? Do I have too much copper? So I, I did this yeah, blood, big blood panel, and in the fridge, I won't gross you out, but in the fridge, I have this gas can thing they gave me for a 24-hour urine test, which I guess is the best magnesium mm-hmm. test. And uh, so I've had to pee in this thing, you know, for 24 hours, and that meant I had to get up in the middle of the night and go down to the refrigerator and and uh, get the gas can out. And uh, and that question that you asked came up, and I thought, huh? But she says the first thing and the best thing you can do in the morning is drink something like green tea, rehydrate to you know hydrate That's your brain, uh, something with polyphenols and antioxidants and some minerals in it. And that's um, the this brings us back to the Dr. Gregor hibiscus tea thing where he's like, yeah. just, just suck on hibiscus tea all day. Yeah, yeah. But then it's really acidic and give you, give you cavities. And <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. So then you have to use a straw. And then it's yeah, like, yeah, good, is, does a straw help you that much? I thought that was kind of a funny... Uh, well, anyway, I had a glass sort of, of green tea last reason. night in the middle of the night when I had to get up and use my gas can. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, that caffeine would destroy me. Oh really? Oh, uh, in the, once I, in the yeah. middle of the night, I sleep like a log. Um, it, and oh from the gosh, middle of the night yeah. till the morning, I sleep like a log. My wife's the opposite. She falls asleep early That's and nice. wakes up in the at four in the morning. Um, I'm yeah. For the copper thing, sorry to interrupt. For the copper thing, you'll obviously know when you get your test. But I'd I'd have to look at it. There's probably some research on blood copper levels and copper versus non copper pipes. Mm. I mean, we've I have copper pipes. Ironically, I'm just right after this, about to replace a large section of my copper pipes with PEX, which of course is plastic and then because it has its own risk, but then I'm going to filter out anyway. Um, but that's just because it's a small, you know, the line's not big enough, I'm adding a bathroom and stuff. Um, and so I have to, uh, well, not just have the whole house on a half of an inch pipe, copper pipe. But I'd love to know that. And then I will say we do have really hard water here to the point where the inside of those copper pipes already has a thin layer of, of calcium carbonate from the on them. Stone. They have atherosclerosis yeah, from the already stone, yeah. to the point where I would be surprised if you could even find any copper in that water. In fact, I had some old copper tubing that I took down yesterday because I replaced, it one, mm-hmm. replaced one line and I bent it. And when I bent it, you could just hear it cracking. Oh, really? You could hear yeah. the stuff cracking on the inside, yeah, which wow. I thought was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. So it's going to help. So it's kind of crazy online. You have almost 400,000 subscribers, but some of these doctors that, that you did an episode on lately, Ken Berry, for example, he has 2.3 million mm-hmm. subscribers. Yeah. I did a chart mm-hmm. of the popularity of you know, plant-based uh, YouTubers versus meat-based YouTubers. So you have Joe Rogan over 10 mm-hmm. million. You have Eric Berg, 8 million. Mm-hmm. Sten Ekberg, 2.3 million, and, you know, they're, they're, just, they're way up in the millions. And no vegan, you know, even Dr. Greger is 800,000, and Rich Roll's 600,000, yep. and you're 400,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would think on the internet, it's all about the meat. But looking at the mm-hmm. trends, meat consumption in the U.S. has dropped by 30% since 1970. And when I toured, mm-hmm. I was just over in Sweden, it, it didn't seem to be this big thing about keto and low-carb and everything seem to be more of an American thing. Um, what, what's your view on why on the internet the Sean Bakers of this world are just so uh, bloody popular? Um, well, right off the bat, even if meat consumption is going down, when you have 90, I mean, I think we're doing pretty dang well when you consider that over 90% of people identify as meat eaters who would probably like to hear good news about their meat consumption. So even if there's a shifting trend, we're still chipping away at this giant mountain of people that consume meat. So the fact that they don't have 40, well, I guess they'd be 10 times higher does sound about right. But the fact that they aren't even 10 times higher, maybe maybe they are if you add them all up. But if you're talking about, you know, 800,000 versus 8 million subscribers, Gregor, the largest vegan versus the largest meat-based one. And Joe Rogan is also, even though he is meat-based, in as a dietary thing, diet is a smaller portion. I feel like you'd have to break it down directly to diet related channels or ones that have like over a certain percentage of their content about diet. For example, mine is like a hundred percent almost. It's like ninety percent diet related. So I'm just happy that there are almost four hundred thousand people that want to hear about a vegan diet that will even subscribe to somebody that has vegan in the name, which was a big debate for me in the beginning. 
I almost didn't do that, but then I felt like I'm I'm constantly manipulating people without it just stamped right there. I see. But then there are people also who see that and they just immediate backfire effect and they go anything anything this guy says it's crazy. I'm not yeah. listening to him at all. But I would just say that even though there's a trend of less consumption of meat and less people eating meat to an extent, it's still a mountain versus a molehill, yeah. sadly. But the molehill is growing, mm-hmm. and so that's why it's not it's not a fifty fifty thing. If we had 150 million people in the U.S. that ate meat and 150 million people in the U.S. that didn't, then it would be like, why, you know, Mm -hmm. why is there a disparity between these? But I believe that uh, the vegans especially would be crushing it as we grow up because it's new information. People would want new, and a ton of people would want Mm -hmm. new information about plant-based stuff. So Mm -hmm. then it would be kablamo exploding. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much the best answer I can give. I'd have to actually look at it more than that. It's a little bit depressing that the decrease in meat consumption by 30% over 50 years um, has been accompanied by an increase in chicken by 160%. Yeah, and I was somebody who grew up just eating chicken and fish, ironically, so I didn't eat red meat. So last question, what is your future? I think about this. Yeah, I uh, obviously I'm getting a master's in public health. There's always people who are like, there's going to come a day when like you don't have anything to talk about on YouTube. Um, and you'll have to just start, people will just stop watching. It'll just, it'll just kind of dry up. And so I'm always thinking in the back of my mind, like, what am I going to do with that? Um, what should I do? And I've, I do have backup plans, which are bad of like, I've accidentally turned into like a contractor by building a tiny house and renovating my own house and all this stuff. Um, so like, if I have to just make money, I can do that and keep making videos, um, vegan videos as long as I want to. Um, but then, of course, getting massive public health, the actual main goal with that, in addition to just having some some degree that was relating to the field that I was talking about on YouTube, at the very least, not even trying to just do it for credibility, but also to just have that on a book as well, if I did write a book, to just make it seem like there is somebody that has some academic training in the subject. Um, so I might start working on a book more. I've sort of outlined a few book ideas, but I don't know really what <laughs> what to choose. And so once I I could start writing, it should have an MPH uh, in 2023. So I could try and, you know, write it without the MPH and then release it. But I don't want to just rush a book out to to do it. I want to have one that's not the same as all these other vegan books. And then, you know, has new stuff to say, actually has a, a value to it that you would read. So that's one thing. There's also this kind of like sort sort of pipe dream idea of making a seer like a really high quality series on just like a six part series on the different diseases and how a plant based diet can help it. You know, there'd be like a heart disease episode, a diabetes episode, cancer episode. And then it would be awesome if that was on Netflix. So like a six part Netflix series of, you know, these different diseases and going through them and meeting people who who have like improved their condition or reversed those conditions. That I think would be really valuable. Because we've had these Netflix movies, but we haven't really had Netflix series that are that are like plant based or vegan related. Which so I think that would be pretty cool, and uh, a way to get that information out there. And other than that, um, yeah, I probably should think about my future more. But uh, I don't know. It's it's uh, something that I I I just like am not wired to think about as much as I should. You have an ebook now, right? It's just a cookbook. We're gonna probably make a. Uh, Instant Pot Cookbook as well. That's sort of something that's been in the works for a while, but it's like, we should just get it done, but then we don't. Because, um, yeah, like right now, it's like renovating the house I bought is, is is like one of my main priorities. Just fully, almost gutted, not gutted it, but almost gutted it free and worked on it for a whole year and then moved into it. And then there's still an upstairs and a downstairs that we're renovating. So like <laughs> that to me, uh, you know, is is maybe, I don't want to let that hold me back, but that definitely takes up a lot of my attention. Fantastic. Well, what do you think I should do? How will we end on that? What, what do you think I should do? Uh, well, that's a good question because I'm sort of, I'm in a similar boat, but I don't have to monetize my channel because I'm, I'm retired and I, and okay. my wife still works and we have savings and everything. So I turn off all the interstitial ads and everything. <laughs> I notice. Oh, that's good. I notice Bart K is... Yeah. Uh, is monetizing my videos. <laughs> it's pretty clever. Oh my gosh! Yeah. So so <laughs> what happens? So what happens is uh, it takes me almost three weeks to do a video, you know, because yeah. I do a lot of research and 
you you're able to do them faster. You're a pro at it, but it, it takes me longer. Well, your production value in in several ways is better than mine. <laughs> well, <laughs> probably just I, story I've, wise and I everything. I fuss over it too much. Anyway, um, and I have other distractions. Although it sounds like you have more distractions than me. Like I, I did an episode on Tim Noakes, um, who I had admired uh-huh. for many many years because he wrote this book, The Lore of Running, and I was doing running, mm. and it was a great book. Um, and he did books on hydration when you're running. V- massive respect in that field as a <laughs> South African professor of physiology. Uh, but then he went low carbon, became a nutritionist, and uh, uh, sort of the conspiratorial ideas came up and so on. And people yeah. kept asking me about him and asking me about him and asking me about him. And I admired <laughs> him for so long, I decided to do an episode on him. And it turns out, in my view, he's gone down a t- dark conspiracy theory sort of path. He did an 11-part series. It's just angry rants, huge long blog posts, 11 hmm. parts. On just cancel keys. It's funny how there's always that anger aspect of it. I yeah. know some vegans are said that they're angry, but there's always that like the conspiracy and the angry tend yeah, to go together. It's crazy. And these are my heroes. I've always, you know, my heroes have been scientists. And in my lifetime, it's changed quite a bit. I'm looking at Time Magazine <laughs> Men of the Year <laughs> uh, in 1961. They were scientists. Linus Pauling is on yep. there, and yep. uh, Shockley's on there. And just two weeks later, they highlighted another scientist who's a big hero of mine, who I think is absolutely uh-huh. terrific. And uh, so, you know, I don't mind if you diss me, but these are my heroes. And if you're going <laughs> to diss them with misinformation and confuse the public, I think I should respond. I forgot. I've lost my whole train of thought. I was asking you a final question. I, you were, I was asking what you, you were talking about, your, oh, what you would do in the future, f- but I had a couple of things yeah. I wanted to say too, so we can get even off more. Yeah. Well, so my future is I like doing these and I like doing them on the environment. And, and so for me, it's not just about diet. It's also about the environment. And I think that's going to be a big issue for ever. My background has been uh, in 1988 when James Hansen, no less than the head of the NASA Goddard Space Studies Institute, testified to Congress about what we're doing to the atmosphere. That guy, you know, has credentials. We as Earth scientists thought, okay, this is our big break. Finally, the public and politicians will know what we're doing to the atmosphere and how threatening it is. But Somehow we let three decades get away from us after he did that. And, and BP misinformation by oh, large huge. fossil fuel Exxon corporations Mobile as well. And the Koch <laughs> and brothers and Exxon, yeah. the yeah. Murdoch Media Empire and so on. And they just fooled everybody into thinking it's a hoax. And, you know, they changed the name from the greenhouse effect and global warming to climate change to make it less threatening and so on. And it wasn't until we could see it with our own eyes you know, that you know, the Amazon is on fire and, and even Siberia is having record fires in Australia and floods. And then it became okay. more real than just some scientists predicting this 30 years ago. But we let 30 years get away from us. And it's kind of like building up plaque in your arteries. It's hard to reverse it after that. So yeah, now that sure. we've <laughs> deforested half the earth and we've removed tropical rainforest just since 2020, the size of Ireland, the UK, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Poland combined. In 20 years, we've done that. Mainly for mm-hmm. the love of beef, because we love the taste of it. Yeah. And we think... Yeah. And ridiculous. the beef marketing is amazing, and you get masculine beef, so what for dinner, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And, um, and uh, we felt, as Earth scientists, we felt when James Hansen first spoke, the public will see, you can't do this forever. You can't burn coal forever. You can't. We, we have to stop. And I feel the same way about beef. You can't eat this forever. You're going to have to stop. <laughs> we can't just turn mm, the Amazon into sure. a savanna. We probably will. But the damage it's doing is just too much. So I feel like however long I'm going to live, I'm going to dedicate my life to speaking at TEDx's like I just did <laughs> and, and doing my YouTube channel and so on about this uh, intersection between earth science and nutrition because <laughs> you know it, it's so important. Yeah, that is, that is huge. So that's good. You'll, you'll have motivation to keep going. That's funny because I have actually considered as a backup plan. I, I've always had contingency plans. And like if people stop getting interested in the vegan stuff or they stop, you know, just wanting, they're just like, you've said everything you need to say about vegan stuff. Then I would maybe switch to an, an even more environmentally focused channel. But as as of now, it's my vegan environmental videos are sadly some of the lower viewed ones. I guess Mine too. for health stuff. Mine too. Yeah. I know I'm going off on tangents, but I think this is an interesting one. Um, 
I, I got some pushback on the Tim Noakes uh, episode saying that was offensive that you called him a conspiracy theorist, you know, on Twitter. I mean, he was banned for it, but it was offensive. Well, I... Yeah, why is this? Come on. I didn't want to give oxygen to all the conspiracy theories, but okay. If you're going to force me to give oxygen to a conspiracy theory, I'll give you one now. So he loves to retweet Peter Clack. So Peter Clack is a long retired journalist in Australia who had a crime reporting beat. And he has his Twitter stream is just a constant stream on how beneficial coal is. You know, it's, it's responsible for the Chinese miracle. It fertilizes plants. It makes the atmosphere much. And the really scary thing the planet is facing is if carbon dioxide gets too low in, in the atmosphere at 150, all life stops. And so, so this is what he's promoting. Whoa. And so Tim That's loves, next level. Yeah, Tim loves to retweet that. So I it's think sad. I have a little bit of a conspiracy theory too. Um, that oh, yeah? Hopefully it's not a conspiracy theory. But let's suppose you're a retired journalist, long retired journalist uh-huh. from Australia, and you had blogged, I found this out from the Wayback Machine, you had blogged about your financial troubles and so on. Wouldn't it be uh, easy for the coal companies to say, hey, how about you do a Twitter channel nah. on promoting coal? And it doesn't matter how insane yeah. it is and sponsor some conspiracy wow. theories because then you can really get traction. Uh-huh. I think that's what happened. Uh-huh. Now, maybe that's my conspiracy theory, but... Yeah, no, that's that's. I, I feel like... That's only slightly a conspiracy theory in that we know that these industries, there's there's solid evidence that these industries are funding uh, public figures and are funding the public messaging. Yeah. And so definitely. the question is, where does that stop? And so we know that there's private individuals that are receiving money. It's obvious. I mean, <laughs> even in a casual basis, like, and some people are better about it. Like uh, that guy, Dr. Mike, he had the a video that was spawned. Was it sponsored by the pork board or was it sponsored by some red meat company yeah. I did a response video I don't think that's what did it but then he took it down because mm. he was started arguing about how on there about how you know red meat is not it's not mm. that carcinogenic or like that's not actually that much of a concern and uh, I think his his ethics kind of got to him and he he probably just gave him the money back and uh, to do which is great but think about all the people that don't do that yeah. and he was more transparent from the beginning saying this is sponsored by blah 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 which most a lot of people don't even do and just the amount of written content and really, and, and radio content as well. It's, it's insane how much through them. It's just market. I mean, they're just having a marketing wing. What's the, what's the marketing wing of the Catalan's Beef Association or whatever? It's now social media is the main marketing tool. Mm-hmm. So of course it's going to, they're going to be paying, they have a social media budget. So they're going to be using that to, to, to get their messaging out there. The question is, how much are they themselves pushing conspiracy theories and mm-hmm. paying for them? And there seems... You know, they seem to be a couple steps away from that, maybe, or maybe directly, or things that are like conspiracy light of, because you'll have people openly writing about Ansel Keys um, and just saying he's wrong, which plays into a conspiracy. But um, are they a conspiracy theorist to mention that Ansel, they think that Ansel Keys was wrong? I don't know. There's a bunch of gray areas, and it's all it's all just really frustrating because there's just so much money on that side. Yeah. And um, yeah, and then for people to go, oh, well, the plant-based industry. <laughs> Uh, maybe someday it'll be the evil giant industry, but uh, it's the same movie as I lived in Earth Science with just different actors. So the yeah. only question you asked that I didn't answer was, what do I think your future should be? Uh, I think you're on to something great. Yeah, I love it. Um, and you're a treasure on the on the internet. And in fact, oh, thank you. I will tell you, there's a guy uh, from Philadelphia who had diabetes and was a little bit overweight, um, was, I think he was trying to do low carb, I'll find out more. And he saw a vegan activist in the park who was holding up a sign, change my mind. I don't know exactly what the sign said, but Uh it was a change my mind thing. So he stopped and argued with him and it bothered him. The argument bothered him, cognitive dissonance and Mm -hmm. everything. And he went home and he started watching your videos and mine. And he decided he would give this a try. And he lost 30 pounds and regained skin health and, you know, reversed his diabetes and all that kind of stuff. And so a year later, he commented on my, one of my uh, videos saying, I'm just checking to see if you still read your comments. And <laughs> I responded, well, yeah, why, yes, I do. Um, what did you have on your mind? And then he told me about this in a YouTube comment. And so I said, can I call you? And, um, and I called him and uh, had a great conversation with him. And he, uh, he said he's never been able to locate that vegan activist to thank him. 
and he was gushing about you and how you'd changed his life. And I said, hmm. So I chased down that vegan activist. I found him. <laughs> nice. And now nice. I've fa- now I've found you. Do you know who it was? Yeah, it's a guy by the name of Andrew who lives in Philadelphia. Cool, I can send cool. you a picture of him. And he's got some information about how to be a vegan activist online. It's a Word doc yeah. or a, a Google doc. Anyway, uh, so yeah. my hopeful future for you is uh, maybe you do a Netflix special that goes that goes big. Yeah, I would be cool with that happening with it. Or I am also, I have an idea for a short film. I don't want to give away the premise on public to the public, but if you're not, I can tell you about it if you're not. I can't imagine you as an evil bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be fun to do. Well, thank you so much. I know we kept you way over time and <laughs> made it hard for your yeah, partner no to work and everything, but you're just so fascinating. I had notes, so many things I wanted to ask you that I didn't ask you, but because that was the rest of the conversation was fascinating. So we'll talk again sometime, you know, maybe I'll bounce ideas off you or you can bounce ideas off yeah. of me because a lot of times like new things come out and I'm sometimes I don't know if there's a video there or not, or like what, you know, what angle is worth approaching at something. Yeah, I'm so. in touch with Simon Hill quite a bit with his podcast and Gil Carvalho. And, oh yeah. And, uh, you know, I like to suggest episodes for them to do where I feel like they were more qualified than me or they have a bigger platform or whatever. And the same with you, you know. Anyway, great talking. Thanks a lot. We'll see you later. Cool. All right. Have a good one. Thanks for having me. Yeah.